It was during a broadcast of BBC Two's Newsnight Review, watched by some million viewers live in their own homes, that this breakthrough came. And again, I was fortunate enough to see this pivotal moment of medical history live. Whilst discussing the Turner Prize exhibition at the Tate Modern, guest reviewer Valdemar Januchak, many of the show's regulars having unfortunately succumbed to it, was holding forth on one of the video installations and claiming that it was a zeitgeist capturing work that effectively reflected, with ironic distance of course, the post-millennial tension of the contemporary artist, when there was a sudden, sickening crack. Janicek twisted uncomfortably in his chair as he released a long, slow fart. His sternum started to noticeably crease under his shirt, and I, along with a million other viewers, watched the scene in terrified anticipation, knowing what was happening, but praying that it wouldn't. It was then that Tom Paulin, apparently unaware of what was occurring at the other end of the table, announced in his laconic Irish tones, uh, This is just a collection of rubbish by a bunch of talentless no-hopers. The cracking and squelching stopped, and I watched in rapt awe. You can't possibly be so fine, or the works of the Chapman brothers, for example, Yanachak coughed out, like most it victims unaware of his predicament, and the snapping continued as he slid under the table, his torso being sucked into his bowels as he spoke. Ah, rubbish, said Paulin. It's all utter twaddle. It's the sort of thing a Sith form art student would produce if he was trying to be clever. And the noises stopped again, and Yanachak, reluctantly nodding in agreement, popped out of his own rectum as if being born again. And then the stunned Mark Lawson, realising the importance of what he'd seen, sputtered something about a cure for it, for this was indeed the first time that an it seizure had ever been reversed. For unbelievable as it seemed, the noted poet and critic Tom Paulin had discovered something that, uh, that had eluded the finest medical minds in the world. He'd discovered a cure for it. Once the cause had been verified as indeed being unembarrassed pretentiousness and shameless strivings to be street, the Ministry of Health issued a massive leafleting and television campaign warning of risky behaviours. White kids had to stop pretending to be Jamaican, hanging loose and sputtering cod patois, while those with no direct links to America were advised to stop using American Argo and wearing t-shirts emblazoned with the logos of baseball teams they'd never seen. Middle class kids were told that assuming a working class accent was incredibly high risk behaviour, as indeed was their parents' leanings toward pretending to be wealthier and more successful than they actually were. The expressions keeping it real and respect due were found to be an almost guaranteed trigger for it, the leaflet's warning of their danger having only half of each expression printed on two separate flyers, employing two different printing firms. Whole sections of libraries were deemed to be high risk. In many institutions, rows of modernist and postmodernist work were pulped, lest they lead the unwary into danger, and the modern French literature section disappeared altogether. The Ministry's spin doctors, themselves a high-risk group, came up with the it equivalent to their predecessor's Don't Dive Ignorance campaign, the rather simple phrase, for fear of the disease itself, call a spade a spade. Thus all pseudo intellectualization ceased. No more Marxist analyses of bus timetables or revisionist theses on the carry-on films. And I have to say, for I was one of them, it seemed as if out of the hideous spectre of it had come the promise of a future golden age. Rock stars could no longer claim that their music was a political statement, but had to begrudgingly admit that it was trivial rubbish that they banged up when drunk. Politicians could no longer avoid answering questions by giving pre-prepared, convoluted and deliberately confusing statements, for obvious lying and half-hearted bullshit was also a primary cause of it. And of course, the Italians had to finally admit that they were not great lovers. It seemed as if mankind was suddenly placed in a world of total honesty where things were as they appeared, and people concentrated more on what they actually believed, rather than what they believed it was fashionable to say. However, and I'm ashamed to admit that it took me so long to see this, as it was in fact about two years after the cure had been developed, there was the inevitable downside. At first there was just a few minor annoyances, those things that irritate without really drawing your attention to them, the never-ending oasis on the radio, the Guardians and Times' exclusives on bordellos in Tipton and sexual peccadillos of Coronation Street stars, the RSC's dozenth season of Andrew Lloyd Webber musicals and reenactments of selected episodes of Classic Blind Date, for example. But only really hit me how profoundly the disease had impacted on the world when I went to the Tate Modern to see the latest Turner Prize exhibition. As I walked around the gallery, there was just row after row of the same kinds of canvas. The cream of the work of Britain's most exciting young artists consisted almost entirely of paintings. No videos, no installations, no happenings. There weren't even any photographs. They were just paintings. All of them figurative. Man at a bus stop, couple on the beach, Scottish castle, and dozens and dozens of pots of flowers. And all of them painted as classically as possible. No primitivism, no expressionism, no impressionism. Just flowers. 
on tables, in pots. Even the likes of Damien Hurst to produce row after row of still lives, although he had tried to challenge the disease and the ever-vigilant curators by exhibiting his famous bisected cow with a cardboard notice stuck to the case saying, this is just a bit of rubbish I knocked off, nothing special really, written on it. And as I left the gallery and flicked through my copies of Take a Break and Loaded, I looked at the people around me, some genuinely happy in this new dumbed-down world, but some reading their rugby magazines with a smile and a glint of quiet desperation in their eyes. So now, even though the number of new IT cases has dropped to a slow trickle, and our funding's been cut, I think I may have finally found a cure, an alternative cure, a less costly cure, for this terrible disease that's changed everything. Dozens of IT cases have been cured with a simple enzyme derived from the liver of the turbot, of all things. In my hands lie the possibility of curing most, if not all, IT patients, and of providing a vaccine for everyone else. I've taken the vaccine myself and have suffered no ill effects. But it's a great, a terrifying responsibility. For days now I've been staring at Lisa Ianson's anus as I consider the possible repercussions of my actions. Perhaps for now I'll just sleep on it, leave it till tomorrow. After all, I'm tired and Proust takes some concentration. <laughs>